I want to just kick off and share a couple of thoughts about why we're here and what we're doing. And as a former IT leader, I would come to these events, not unlike yourselves, and I was here usually for one of a couple of reasons. Usually it wasn't for a sales pitch, it wasn't for someone to do a demo. I can usually find those pretty easily, and Lord knows if I talk to a sales rep, I can get the pitch. I came to these events because I wanted to meet my peers, because I wanted to listen and learn from them about what they were doing. And I don't know what motivated you to come, but I hope it is these op objectives, because that's what we've tried to put together for a program of sorts to talk about. Now, does anybody have other objectives here tonight? Uh, if you're looking you know, for jobs, I do have a web page up of We Are Hiring. I'll, I'll be glad to go through the open positions. We've got a number of them that are open, so we'll, we could talk about that. Uh, we are growing rapidly, so hopefully the, from an agenda perspective, this meets your needs. If not, let me know, because we can tailor this on the fly and, make it, and make, it, make it flexible to meet your needs. And feel free to grab a seat. Welcome. A lot of times when I talk to people about the trends and the things they're experiencing, they, they end up talking about digital transformation. This is a cliche topic, and it's one that a lot of enterprises and organizations are wrestling with. And it's one that... When I've looked at the data and I've talked to people, I come away with some, some things that are sometimes disconcerting, especially when as many people are doing it. And when you look at it, digital transformation is not something that's just happening here. It's not something that's just happening with a few unicorn companies. It's happening in enterprises everywhere from old style insurance companies to the government with three letter agencies that we can't talk about. It's happening in countries around the world. And when we look at this, the World Economic Forum produced, and they worked with Accenture, they produced a really awesome study. I've got links to it here if you want to pull it up. But they pulled up and they produced this long, detailed study of what does it mean when people say digital transformation. And it's ultimately, it's about changing the business. It's about changing the way businesses interact with their customers. It's changing the relationships. It's about taking advantage of a networked economy, a digital economy to be more efficient, to innovate on business models. I mean, th I think about how radically different it is when I come here and I get in a car driven by someone I don't know that a little app on my phone somehow is enabled. How many years ago was that a foreign idea? It wasn't very long that it was, you would automatically get a get a cab or rent a car. Today, I get into a car shared by a friend of mine who I've just met moments ago because of this really cool mobile app. It's radical if you think about it. But that little mobile app is disrupting a massive industry. I've gone off and stayed at friends' houses. I didn't know them before I went to their house. But a little app allowed me to get to know them, and then they shared their house with me. Airbnb doesn't own any land or any real estate, but they account for millions of nightly stays. Amazing transformation. It's a huge thing that's happening. And it's hard, though. It's not, the e it's not an easy thing for Hilton or for American Express or for Goldman Sachs or for any traditional companies to go through this transformation. They have a all sorts of legacy challenges that hold them back. And, and as a result, there, a lot of them are somewhat behind the power curve in getting started. Because as they go down this curve, they're trying to get started to move faster. They're trying to understand how can they get from where they are to being more innovative faster than the competition. You know, Mark Andreessen wrote this series of tweets about cycle time compression and how that's a key between winning and losing. There's a series of tweets that he basically described how mobile apps and software as a service allow for faster innovation and therefore will win over time. He made the comparison that people don't buy cars anymore. That it's not about buying cars, it's more about the phone. Phones iterate faster, the car is a feature for the phone. Think about that. How many times have you thought about, will the, my phone be compatible with the car I'm shopping for? It's a radical change and it's one that 10 years ago, I don't think any of us would have thought that was true. Mark, 
you know, he, he saw that where it was coming. And I think his quote is spot on. And, and as we try to go faster, this is where it gets to be hard. And looking at the data, Forrester's written you know, a report on this where Ted Shadler wrote a report talking about how hard it is to get started with digital transformation. IDC did this study a about a year ago about where people were at. And I did the math. I, my addition to this was the math. 45% of organizations haven't started. If this is as big a deal as we all talk about it, as common as everybody talks about, why is it that 45% have not even started to figure this out? And the reason, and I think the reason is really clear. There are lots of challenges. There are lots of challenges from the different teams, the processes, the tools they're using, the silos in the organization, the different goals and objectives. And then think about it. Most of these organizations have goals or objectives like we have to, I mean, how many of you are in an organization where the goal is to go faster? How about more efficient? Maybe more secure, lower risk? You're probably all three, right? These goals and objectives are out there and you're all trying to drive towards doing that, but you all run in. Okay, cool. You're putting on the helmet. I was getting worried about where I was going with this. You know, I, yeah, you maybe want me to speed up. The, uh, but the reality is these challenges are out there. And last year, or earlier this year, we, we started talking to Chris about looking at some of the challenges that impact people and impact organizations with accelerating software delivery so that they can meet the needs of the market. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Chris and I'll double click the slides to PowerPoint so you can share what you've learned and what you've discovered. All right, thanks very much. Yeah, so thank you very much, John. Thanks, uh, GitLab, for having me here today. Um, so um, let me see where this goes right into. I'll just give you, yeah, manage your tool chain before it manages you. Uh, so I'm Chris Kondo. I'm from Forrester Research uh, from the East Coast. Uh, we work out of the Cambridge office there, right next to Alewife, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, I uh, came to be an analyst about three years ago. Uh, previously, I had worked at companies like Microsoft, um, and then a long, long time ago, a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. But at Microsoft, I really, really started learning about this whole idea of automation, uh, product focus, the idea that um, being focused on the customer, being focused on delivering um, you know, an experience that is delightful to your user is very important. Uh, when, we were, when I was developing for them uh, from 99 to 2014, we were in their New England Research and Development Office in Cambridge, right next to MIT, and we were an out, sort of an, an offshoot of their Office 365 team. And so that's what, you know, back then we had to write all our own DevOps tools because Microsoft had a no um, open source uh, policy. And we, uh, we did our own automation. We had to write our own deployment scripts. Azure didn't have any at the time. And so it was really kind of like a bootstrap effort. Uh, fast forward to, to today, and you see that there's just a plethora of tools available, but you know, not everybody's using them. So let's just jump right into it. So um, the agenda is you know, teamwork and tools are paramount to accelerating software delivery. Um, We'll talk about the custom research that we did on behalf of GitLab and, and the survey that we ran, and then some recommendations uh, about you know, choosing a modern single tool chain can be beneficial. Uh, the interesting thing that kind of uh, got me down this path is when I, my very first research project was actually part of my interview process at Forrester. So when you want to become an analyst at Forrester, they actually make you write a research paper. And then they actually make you deliver it in front of a bunch of analysts. And so throughout this whole process, which took several months, my wife kept saying, they're trying to steal your ideas. Don't take that job. Stop doing that. And like, you know, if you walk in there and they don't offer you this much money, you're walking right out the door. And so, uh, you know, but if you know where Lowell Mass is, that's where she's from and you'll understand what I'm talking about. But anyways, um, she, uh, so I went in and uh, we, we, we did this whole report. Uh, I did this whole report on um, DevOps transformation in the cloud. And then I interviewed a lot of teams and they're like, you know, we spend like 10% of our resources just managing our tool chain. We spend this much time spending our on, you know, managing our on-premise tool chain. If somebody could offer something, you know, a cloud-hosted tool or, or, or a solution that can alleviate that pain from us, we'd be willing to go for it. So kind of got me down this whole agenda. So a little bit more about Forrester, work with businesses and technology leaders to develop customer accept strategies that, that drive growth. So the whole customer obsession, focus on the customer, it's been something that Forrester has been behind for quite a long time. So let's, uh, let's talk about it, right? So teamwork and tools are paramount to accelerating software delivery. You know, this is sort of like the, uh, the metaphor for the modern DevOps team. Everyone's got a different role, but everyone has to work together. And they have to work fast, right? You only have so much time to get it right. 
you have so much time to keep the release moving along, um, and there's a lot of pressure on these teams, right? So if we, you know, John just talked about the digital transformation. He referenced Ted Shadler's report. Ted's a you know, vice president, principal analyst at, um, at Forrester, and he wrote this report, The Sorry State of Digital Transformation, where he talked about the fact that all of these companies are under so much pressure, and some of them actually think they're done, and he's like, that's the most ridiculous thing is that people think they're done with digital transformation. The idea is once you've embraced it, you realize it's just not gonna end. It's just gonna keep going on. Along with that, Forrester has all, a lot of other research that backs up the idea that customer experience is a real driver for revenue, a real driver for keeping your business up and running, and a real driver for winners and losers in this market. And so when you put those two things together, it gets back to that Mark Andreessen quote, right? The idea that cycle time compression is really putting a lot of pressure on our feature teams. So we took a look at um, some research and we uh, said, oh, you know, what is the current release frequency and we said, all right, well, in 2000, this is actually from, we actually have newer data from 2019 that shows the same number, but for the last five years previous, this is pretty much the graph for release cycles for the people that we interview. So we sent out a survey to about, it's, it's a little bit more than this now, but it's about 3,000 developers. And these, um, you know, these are all customers of Forrester, so they're like uh, insurance companies, banks, all these companies that um, are struggling with their digital transformation efforts. And by and large, most of them are stuck in this like middle, average once per quarter release. Um, only very few, you know, uh, five and six percent are doing a release a day or, a, you know, multiple times a day. And, uh, you know, the, so the vast majority of the area under the curve is between a month and a year. So not really agile, right? If you have a bug fix, you're not getting out the door anytime soon. If you have to get something uh, in front of a customer, you want to try it out, it ain't happening anytime soon. And so by and large, the majority of customers that we deal with are struggling with this digital transformation effort. Now you can go look at like other research from like Dora or even um, you know, the state of supply chain. They all have, I would say, sort of like interviewing or, or surveying companies maybe at a broader uh, sense. Maybe there's more, more smaller, more cloud native companies that are able to kind of push these numbers uh, you know, closer to these you know, more, more daily release or more weekly release. But by and large, the, the people that we're interviewing are, are stuck and they're, and they're looking for help. Here's another thing, right? So this sort of uh, calls out the 2018, 2019 data where uh, it's showing some improvement finally in the customer base that we have. So apparently our subscriptions are, are doing something for these people, they're finally getting unstuck. But um, they're still not doing quite well. They're, they're, they're still kind of still over here. And then um, if you, if a lot of teams, you know, say they're more agile, but the reality is that, um, you know, it went from, you know, we think we're kind of agile too. Yeah, we're, we're pretty agile over here. You know, most of them are saying that they're, they're using agile, but a lot of companies still are stuck in this sort of like fake agile world where even though they want to do agile, even though they've got all these scrum teams and they've got all these uh, meetings set up, it's really just a big waterfall project chopped up into 10 easy, 10 easy projects, right? And the requirements never change, the backlog never changes. Um, it only grows, it never actually shrinks. <laughs> and so uh, the whole idea of you know, iterate, learn, and then readjust just doesn't happen on these teams. What usually happens is they start with their first release, somebody realizes there's five more things that they want to add, but they don't care about the things that they might want to take off, and the workload just keeps growing. And that's how you get stuck with these people that aren't very agile and are releasing once a quarter or, or once every six months because they just don't understand what it means to really be agile, which is the ability to not only add things in respond to customers' demand, but to remove them based on the on lower priorities, right? To be to be responsive to what's going on and what's important. Here's another interesting one. I'm not sure if I even believe this data, to be quite honest, because it shows continuous integration that only 31% of the, of the folks that we surveyed, you know, 3,294 developers, claim to be using continuous integration. I just I, it, it's what it, the data is, and maybe it's the way the, the question is, um, is, is asked, but it just seems absolutely ludicrous to me, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, when you look at this data, it just shows that there's a complete lack of modern techniques or modern tools and technologies being used. And maybe that is the state of things, right? When you actually start looking at the data, maybe the reality is that not everyone's actually using continuous integration on a daily basis. Maybe they're doing, you know, a batch build job at night, or maybe they're doing, you know, maybe they're not doing it at all. And, um, it, you know, you have to feel bad for people in that situation. So 
Teams tell followers to too many tools create friction, right? So this is one of the problems that they have, right? 71% um, agree that governance and end-to-end -end visibility of software delivery are major challenges, right? So one of the problems that folks talk about is that like, well, you know, we work in a regulated industry and almost every step of the development process, we have to do an audit or we have to do a manual check, we have to do a manual review. Somebody has to come in and look at stuff and approve things and sign things off. Um, each tool chain maintains security differently, complicating access control, right? So someone says, hey, I want to create a brand new tool. I want to create a new build pipeline. I want to, I want to get started on my, um, on my project, but I'm waiting because the, um, the, the, the permissions have to be set up and the, the tool chain is really complex. And so the, the um, operations person or whoever's managing the tool chain has to manually go and configure all these things and it's really complicated or I can't get access when I need it, right? Um, many estimate managing tool chains consumes 10% of their development. That's what I, I, I said at the very beginning that I first learned about this whole problem where teams are complaining that like, hey, um, I, I feel like, you know, I got 100 developers and 10 of them are always managing the tool chain. I'd gladly, you know, buy something. I'd gladly, you know, rent something in the cloud if it meant I didn't have to do that. Yes? Um, this, this particular case was 10% of the development team and developers, right? So they, these, are, these are like, uh, they don't have a separate team managing their tools, they're actually managing it themselves. Is, does that answer your question? Okay. And then 67% um, agree that handoffs between uh, different teams using different tools slows down delivery, right? So this is another problem, right, where uh, a, lot of a lot of different teams have their own roll your own tool chain or each team has a different tool chain. They've all incorporated open source tools. They've all built their own uh, different bespoke tool chains and, and now uh, you know, you're trying to you know, transfer work from one place to another and it's not going very well. Oh, hit the wrong button. Uh, so this is the respondents demographics. 100% uh, in an IT role, uh, respondent level you know, manager, uh, team ar architect, director, vice president, C-level executive. So you know, a good meet, meaty section of people that are actually doing the work and then a nice smattering of people who want to make sure that these guys are doing their job. Um, you know, by and large, Western Europe, US, and I guess that counts as US as well, but I wonder how much DevOps is going on up there. Maybe a lot, who knows. Um, job function, uh, IT and infrastructure operations, by and large, you know, for most traditional companies, these are the people that own the tools and operate the tools. Th those teams are trying to become more agile, you know, application development, and then it kind of goes down the road from there. And then the company size, by and large, you know, 51%, 5,000 to 19,000, oh no, I'm sorry, 1,000 to 40, to, to almost 5,000 employees, and then, you know, 20,000 or more is the smallest one. So, you know, a pretty good, pretty good distribution. Pretty good number, um, and it's 252 professionals. I don't know why that was in there. All right, so teams have too many tool chains and too many tools to manage. So this is one of the interesting things that came out of the survey data, right? So to the best of your knowledge, how many different software delivery tool chains does your software organization maintain? So you know, the, the, the biggest number was two tool chains, but the second biggest number was three to five tool chains. So, um, you know, one tool chain, maybe that's too unreasonable because like, you know, if you're dealing with multiple technology stacks, like maybe your team's big enough that you have a Java stack, you have a Microsoft stack, you know, like a mobile, like maybe Android, and you might want Android and you might want native, uh, you know, iOS, right? So you might want all those things. Um, you know, maybe you do need three or four different tool chains to manage it, but that just puts a lot of burden on these teams. And then you get up here in some of these other folks where, you know, 21 tool chains, 11 to 20, 6 10 tool chains, right? This is just like ridiculous, right? So those are obviously from the larger companies, but this means that the person who answered said they're managing this many tool chains. So it doesn't mean that like, just because a company has 20,000 employees doesn't mean that, and they could possibly support, you know, 20 different tool chains, doesn't mean they're dispersed all over the place. It could mean that this, this team is actually stuck managing them for, for teams that are local to where they are. And then to the best of your knowledge, how many different tools comprise your current software delivery tool chain, you know, the majority is one to five. So, you know, a pretty decent backbone, probably some CI, CD, an agile planning tool, maybe a release tool, maybe a static analysis tool. Six to 10 tools though is 30%. So now you're getting a little bit more complexity, right? We didn't, I'm not sure if we actually dug in on the complexity, maybe it's in the next slide. And then 11 to 15, 16 to 20. So if you take this box right here and you, and, and you, and you multiply that out, right? That's hundreds of different tools that are being managed by the same team. 
That means hundreds of different licenses, hundreds of different updates, hundreds of different interconnections. It's, it's really quite a mess. And it's quite a burden, right? So how do teams, how do teams end up with so many tools? The, the drivers to expand a number of tools within the tool chain, organic growth and maturity of the CI-CD automation market, right? So they, they, they started with a basic tool chain, and they're like, hey, this looks good, let's add that on, and that looks good, let's add that on. And then, you know, of course we need some static code analysis, of course we need SonarCube, of course we need all these things. But then that particular tool chain lives in one team. Then the other team is doing something very similar, only they're downloading a different version of it, or maybe a later version of it. And then before you know it, even though the two tool chains might resemble each other on paper, in actual practice, they're two completely different snowflake environments because they're different versions of Jenkins, they're different versions of Sonar, they're different versions of agile planning tools, and, and the two things have incompatible APIs, and it becomes a real big mess, right? Um, greater awareness of test automation, security scanning, cloud native technology such as Docker, right? So people see these goodies and they want to add them. Why not, right? New is good, more is better. Drivers for the expansion for the number of tool chains Test autonomy, team autonomy in selecting their own tool chain. So this idea that like, you know, teams should be able to select the tools that are best fit for their team, it's a nice concept, but what ends up happening is you end up getting a sprawl, right? And, and then you get clients that call me and say, you know, we've got 10 different tool chains and I'm an enterprise architect and I work for a big bank and my job is now to, to wrangle all these things together and come up with a common set of tools. What am I supposed to do because all the developers are gonna commit mutiny on me and I don't wanna piss anybody off. And it's like, oh, you gotta manage that. We gotta figure out a way to keep everybody on board, give them what they want, but maybe standardize somehow, right? Diverse technology stacks lead to different tool chains. So we talked about that, right? Mobile apps versus web server. And then these enterprise silos, that's probably, probably the evilest one, right? Where um, you've got these different business divisions or maybe you've got different divisions within the same, same business unit and you know, one particular uh, set of developers and, and, and managers and designers worries about one aspect of your application. You know, maybe you're an insurance company and they worry about you know, how they're acquiring new customers, whereas the other one worries about how are we actually processing you know, claims, how are we doing all the forms, and they're in like, just completely separate worlds, even though those two things are supposed to work together somehow. So that's how teams kind of end up with so many tools and so many num and, and different tools in, the, in so many different tool chains. Tool chain responsibility gets spread out. Which teams are ultimately responsible for maintaining your tool chain? That's the question we asked. And what, this is with a burden. 40% is on the development team. So when I talked about you know, 10%, people, you know, that was an anecdotal number. Uh, you know, I, I, I listen to clients, I interview people, they tell me, um, you know, I don't know, it's roughly 10%. I don't have a survey that exactly says that. But then this actually come, came back in this survey, it was really, I guess it was kind of rewarding. I feel like sometimes I'm a little bit like Columbo where I just sort of stumble around and listen to people and come to a conclusion that sometimes doesn't seem like it has any basis, but it turns out I was right. So um, development teams are really overburdened with these tools. Why do you think that is though? Well, typically it's a developer who understands how to automate things. A lot of companies have test teams, but, they don't, but those testers don't necessarily understand automation. Right? So who, they might have an IT team who understands how to script, who understands how to you know, do some automation, but not in a development sense, right? Not necessarily traditionally, a not every traditional INO person understands how to code and, and instantiate infrastructure uh, and use you know, Java or YAML or other types of languages that can instantiate, understand how to compile and build code. So developer team, development teams, a lot of the burden falls on them mainly because they want to go faster. They're the ones that are pushing the rest of the team to go faster. So they take on this burden saying, well, we've got to do this. This is how we're going to manage it. Release teams and DevOps teams. That's a growing uh, sort of like faction within teams where they say, well, this particular skill set is kind of unique. It's different from just software development. It combines software development and infrastructure. Um, there are people that just sort of naturally gravitate towards that on both those teams. Let's put them together and maybe Maybe that'll be a good way to be a self-service DevOps team that can create self-service tool chains, that can create uh, managing um, and, and help manage that burden for our development team, take it off the development team, kind of take it off the operations team, and put it on this middle tier team. Well, that works pretty well, but th those folks are still, if they're managing 20 tool, tool chains, and each of those tool chains has five tools, you know, that's five times 20, that's 100, right? That's a lot of stuff to manage still, even for a team that's dedicated to that. Um, not bad considering I've jet lag. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then it goes down to software tools and operations teams. So you know, 
uh, by and large, 70% is on these teams right here. So that's a lot. It's a lot of burden. And it's, what, it, what it really is is sort of like the cost and burden of managing these tools means that these folks who are working on this aren't creating business value. They aren't um, helping you know, with the customer experience. They're not helping design the next architecture. They're not developing um, necessarily uh, you know, the next feature set. They're worried about just the plumbing and the fixtures that keep the whole business running. Now, when I went to a DevOps uh, meetup at Wayfair, um, they have a really cool office. Not quite like this, but they're in Copley Square in Boston. Copley Square is a really expensive mall in the middle of Boston, and in the tower are all these developers working there with this funky furniture that nobody bought, fuzzy lights and you know, crazy chairs and stuff, and all the street signs that are, point to different furniture departments are actually different development teams. And so um, they did a really cool DevOps meetup, and they talked about the fact that they consider DevOps sort of like a differentiator. So they sort of embrace it, like, you know, we're in this to win it, and we're up against Amazon, we're up against Walmart, and we're the little guy. You know, even though there's a thousand developers here, even though we, you know, we make billions of dollars, we're the really, really tiny online retailer compared to these other guys. So, you know, they consider these things just the way they have to operate. It's, it's a differentiator. Uh, the ability to release and own their own tool chain and develop fast is something that they realize is what's going to make them a differentiator. So that's why a lot of these teams take these burdens on. Integrating those tools becomes a labor-intensive challenge, right? So what's the biggest problem? Our, our tool chain is integrated with a combination of plugins and scripts, right? So 40% of the folks who have one or two tool chains tell you that, and three plus tool chains say that. So, you know, if you're, if you're installing plugins onto your, uh, your CI server, and then that becomes a unique installation. Now that becomes a different server than the other server that has different plugins. They all become snowflakes. They all become independent points of failure, independent points of management, into points of, independent points of pain in the ass. Um, our tool chain is integrated uh, via well-defined uh, APIs. Well, that would be nice, right? So 18% have one to tool chain, two tool chains, and three plus tool chains is 30%. So that's good, right? So well-defined APIs, that helps you. Loosely coupled architectures, but still, a bit of work to maintain when you need to update those APIs. Our tool chain is integrated manually via hard-coded custom integration between tools. So these folks have a rather you know, tenuous relationship with their tool chain, 23% and 17%. And then we have an out-of-the-box software delivery tool chain that is integrated end-to-end. -end. These are the GitLab customers, apparently. Um, and then our tool chain is not integrated. So, um, <laughs> oops, that happens, right? Uh, <laughs> or, or, or they're using another brand that we're not going to talk about. Anyways, uh, uh, so then there's also this skill gap, right? So these are the other problems that, that come up, right? So skill gap emerges. Teams struggle to maintain the vast number of uh, different tools and their integrations, right? So insufficient skills, expertise, and resources to integrate discrete, til discrete tools, right? 46%. So what does that mean, right? So it kind of goes back to that whole thing. The reason why developers are in charge of the tool chain is because they're the folks that typically understand how to integrate tools together. They're typically the people who understand APIs, who understand how these things all have to plug together, and they understand how, so how they want their software built. So when there's an inf inf insufficient skill set or, or, or body of, uh, of or resources to pull from, you end up pulling from your development team. Um, insufficient skills, expertise, or resources to maintain the tools. So that's another big problem. So it's one thing to build the tool chain. It's another thing to maintain the tool chain. Um, and then you know, the behavior change needed to maximize these tools, lack of executive leadership, and NA, we don't face any challenges in this area at all. We're just happy having a great time. So that's 7%. So 7% of all the respondents say they're just happy. Um, and so you know, by and large, people are dealing with resource issues. They're dealing with skill set issues. They're dealing with the fact that um, it's just hard to maintain all these tools. So IT professionals struggle to maintain secure tool chains. Here's another one that's kind of interesting thing that came out of it. Which of the following process challenges does your team currently face with its tool chain? And difficulty ensuring security across the tool chain was 45%. So now, I think if we asked this question a few years ago, probably security wouldn't have been a big issue, right? But you know, when you install you know, the open source version of Jenkins and everyone has root access to your server and you know, that's the way that all these tools actually integrate together is they have an admin, hard-coded you know, credential, then you, you know, when, 
When it's just amongst us friendly developers, no big deal, right? But then once you start expanding this, uh, this tool chain and more and more actors start being part of it, then you realize, hey, guess what? We've got basically, there's a, there's a back end network of all these development tool chains that all have hard coded credentials that anybody has access to and could access other assets within the company. Now people suddenly realize after all the breaches that have gone on, like at Target and other uh, you know, high profile um, company uh, breaches that security is a big issue. And, main, and, and then they started looking at these software delivery tool chains and realized every one of these tools has to be configured for security differently. Every one of them has different ways of managing RBAC, different ways of managing SSO, different ways of how they communicate with the next tool up and the next tool down. And that's when the concern really started hitting home that this is a really big problem, right? It's been sort of like a, a, something that's been sort of swept under the rug for a long time, but, but, but not anymore, right? Lack of visibility is the other one, right? So once you've automated a lot of these things, uh, you know, it, it sort of goes into a black box and comes out the other side, but you're like, all right, well, you know, do I know how fast we're actually working now? Do I, you know, where's all that data? Is it, is, it, is it something I can look at? Is it something I can comb through? Is there any way I can understand what our, our cycle time is, our velocity? Um, you know, and so what's happening is all these tools are sort of creating like an opaque veneer uh, around the entire software delivery process. And so these, these particular um, folks who answer this are like, you know, we want greater visibility of you know, what's going on, how the artifacts are being passed along, you know, what's the handoff look like, who's doing what, and you know, some ability to get an audit uh, because you know, we're a bank or we're an insurance company or we're in the government and we need to understand who worked on what when, when did that work item get picked up, how long did it take for the work item to get processed, things like that that we talked about at Forrester called value stream management or the whole idea of like lean software development where you try to really understand the full process from end to end and get visibility into that process. So those are two things that, that really came out of this survey that are really quite interesting that I'm not sure that we expected. I think we just expected it to be a maintenance nightmare and that was the end of it. But this is another problem. Poor usability across the tool chain is the third one, right? The idea that these tools are just difficult and they're kind of bearish to work with. They, you know, one, one tool might be really elegant. Maybe, maybe you're using a really great agile planning tool like Jira uh, and, uh, and you think it's great, but then you go onto your CI tool and like everything just falls apart, right? Uh, and so, the idea that you get you know, poor visibility, poor usability across the tool chain, you know, it, it, I, I look at that as spottiness, right? Some tools are good, some tools are bad. And then back to these other things, right? Insufficient skills, insufficient resources, difficulty in implementing chargeback models, um, you know, and then you know, we don't face any challenges, 4%. What's that? Chargeback? Yeah, I don't know if that is. I'm pretty sure that is just, yeah, actually, I think it's a financial idea, the idea that you want to actually um, figure out how to, how to pay for this particular thing. Like, so you're, you've asked an IT team to support you, and now they want money from your development team for doing some work for you. And it's like, well, how do you manage all that? How do you work between cost center to the cost center? And so what can happen sometimes is you say, well, you know, I'm the development team, I need you to fix this. And they're like, well, we're not going to do it unless you, know, you fund us. I'm like, well, we're not going to fund you, so we'll have a developer do it because we're sick of dealing with all the red tape inside our internal bureaucracy system. Um, th that's what I believe it means. That's my interpretation anyways. Yes? Okay. The audience agrees. Um, IT professionals see benefits from an out of the box tool chain. So, so which of the following benefits do you anticipate realizing or have you realized from a new out of the box tool chain management system? And so this one, so when we thought it was gonna be like, oh, we thought we were, we were gonna see um, well, it's a lot easier to maintain my tools now. But risen to the top is improved quality. Improved quality of their products. Why? Maybe it's because they're able to focus on developing their products now versus developing their tool chain, right? Maybe it's because the tool chain now kind of works for them rather than them working for the tool chain and they're actually able to think about, you know, and get visibility into it and understand what's going on inside all the different software delivery process. Improved security improved developer productivity. So these three right here are all the sort of like sore points that people had earlier got solved by this idea of, you know, this is what you can get from a complete connected and integrated tool chain. That's pretty stunning. It's, it's sort of like a nice reflection on, on the pain that, that we saw earlier. We also saw increased revenue, increased compliance, improved time to value, 
And then, you know, all the way down, lower cost, you know, lower costs and cost savings of managing it, uh, faster onboarding times, um, improved visibility, improved developer job satisfaction, increased code sharing, and we have received no benefits, 5%. So this 5% is just, they just live on the island. I'm not quite sure what they're doing. They're, they're always talking about how they're happy, but then they, they have no benefit. So I'm not quite sure what that's all about. But um, so it's really quite, quite interesting. And it's quite a, quite a way that, interesting how the data kind of sort of handshakes it's, it together. And so um, the ability to target any environment cloud was a top business benefit. This is something that, um, you know, actually, I'm going to go back to the, I, my, my, my day of uh, going to the, uh, the Wayfair DevOps meetup. They actually hosted it in their, in their building, and they, they gave out DevOps t-shirts and free sandwiches. It was really great. It was one of the best moments of my life, I guess. Anyways, um, they, uh, <laughs> they, they talked about the fact that, you know, they host on Amazon, Google, and Azure simultaneously. And to them, multi-cloud was extremely important because, first of all, they compete with Amazon, but they host on Amazon, so they have this kind of weird relationship with them. And then what they don't want to do is be beholden to one particular cloud vendor or have to suffer an outage and, and not be able to have a backup plan. So they have a dynamic system where they go you know, multi-cloud. That was really the first time I heard about someone really truly buying in on multi-cloud. Since that time, Forrester has done a lot of research, uh, not just you know, this particular uh, survey, uh, analysts like Lauren Nelson, they all talk about the fact that customers are asking for multi-cloud solutions. They don't want to be locked into one particular vendor. They want the ability to shift workloads or do workload appropriate things for each cloud. Each cloud has different strengths and weaknesses. Or they want to be able to shift storage back and forth when they want to. Or they want to have some things on premise, some things in the cloud. So the whole idea that they don't want to be locked in they, don't, they want to have the ability to move things around. And so we're seeing that come through in this particular survey as well. The ability to deploy any target environment or cloud, 25%. That was the, the biggest number. The next one is simplified maintenance. So even though people want simplified maintenance, um, you know, they want um, you know, to make the tool chain easier, a big business driver is the ability to be multi-cloud. And that was another kind of surprise out of, the whole, out of this whole survey, which was you know, a pleasant surprise. And you know, 77% agree that organizations is moving to the cloud and want to avoid cloud blocking. Our future is multi-cloud. So that's, it's really quite, uh, quite interesting and, and kind of bucks the trend of what some cloud uh, vendors will tell you. So why is multi-cloud important? You know, avoid getting locked in. I, I, guess, I guess I already talked about it. Deploy and host your applications or components you know, to any of the providers that best match your functional needs. I mean, maybe you don't want to host on one of the big public clouds. Maybe you want to host on Oracle. Uh, right? And so, uh, you know, you should have the choice. And then, uh, you know, public cloud out outages are, are rare, but they happen. Uh, you know, S3 outage, there was an Azure DevOps outage. You know, so, um, you know, do you want to be reliant on one particular vendor? You know, if you're in the government or you're, uh, you know, in a financial technology services, you know, are you, you're trading, you know, thousands of transactions a minute and you're going to invest in a cloud vendor are you going to put all your eggs in one basket, or are you going to have a plan B and a plan C, right? Um, you just can't afford to be down when being down means maybe millions or billions of dollars you know, of lost revenue. So, uh, and there's also the whole idea of like governance, where many firms have to have multiple sources uh, of, of, for their vendors. So there's a lot of different reasons why multi-cloud is, I think, going to become a more important aspect for larger enterprises. For smaller companies, I think it's not a big deal, right? It's like, hey, we're you know, 100 people, we're a startup, or, or we're beyond startup, and we're getting bigger. You know, maybe that's not such a big deal, right? Maybe it's OK just to invest in one particular vendor. But if you're a large firm, if you have a lot of different technology stacks, you, know, you want to be able to have the choice. So what can teams do? Reduce the diversity of tool chains within the enterprise. Duplicated functionality is wasteful, right? So if you have multiple tools all doing the same thing, and they're all working on the same stack, why bother, right? Is it just because it's some particular person's pet, pet project? Or is it actually doing any value, right? So the whole idea is measure the value. You know, does, it, does it support open standards? Is it, um, does the tool chain simplify security and risk compliance? Does the tool chain allow you to deploy where it's most advantageous? Will the tool chain be easy to maintain, right? So you look at these factors and you, saw, you try to think about, you know, it's great that I'm giving my developers choice, but you know, we're all working for a business to make money. And uh, sometimes that means a little bit of standardization. Sometimes that means a little bit of um, you know, trying to bring things 
uh, to sort of like an even keel so that different developers can jump from different teams and you could have mobility, you could have the ability to, um, you know, you, you, can, you can get all the tools you want, but you can just do them in kind of a standard way. So in summary, uh, software delivery automation is a business differentiator. Uh, you know, m all the companies that are going through digital transformation that are suddenly realizing that, oh, guess what? You know, we are actually, our product is going to be a software platform which we deliver our services on. It's not that, you know, the software is just there to be part of the claims management process or it's not just there, to, you know, to be our website for the banking. It actually is our product now and we just happen to sell financial services on it. We happen to sell banking on it or the government happens to do your taxes on it. Um, Government, I mean, custom best of breed tool chains provide differentiation, but they come at a cost, and that cost gets multiplied when there are multiple tool chains, right? So not every team wants to take on that cost. Not every team can afford to take on that cost. And if you have a choice and you don't need to take on the cost, why would you want to? And then choosing a modern single tool chain solution can be beneficial. It's less maintenance. You look for ones that have open standards that enable extensibility so that you you know, you want, one of the biggest reasons why tool chains of the past, like uh, if you look at, uh, you know, IBM's Rational, you know, the original Microsoft TFS, uh, ClearCase, they were all closed systems, right? If you wanted to add a scanning tool, if you wanted to do something, you had to kind of do it on your own. Um, you want something that's got APIs, that allows loosely coupled architectures, that allows you to plug in tools as you need to, so you can sort of have this backbone of a, of a tool chain and then hang the other pieces off of it so you don't have to worry about managing all of it. Simpler security model, less time spent on automation, more, sp more time spent delivering value, and then freedom to host and deploy where you need, right? So that's, that's the really the big benefit that we see, that, that, we, that we feel that this survey and this data is pointing to. So uh, Q&A, thanks very much. Oh. Q&A for you. Oh, all right. So if, if you have questions, I have a mic, I'll walk around and do the MC thing. Anybody have questions for Chris? Someone must have a question. No, none. Yeah. None. Nope. Here we go. <laughs> so you, you had a slide where you were talking about, uh, I don't know if it works, but um, you had a slide where you were talking about how um, it was what people wanted to gain and also what they did, but that's actually two very different things. Um, that's true. You mean like uh, what we hope to get out of it and what we did get out of it? You yeah. Mean that slide? Yeah. yeah. And so I just, I, like, it made me curious. You know, of the people who hoped to get it, what percentage of, you know, how do they I don't know if we cut the data that way or not. We probably have to go back and look at it. If they got it, yeah. Yeah. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. We cut the data about 50 different ways. <laughs> trying sure. to, uh, And um, we can look at I don't. I don't know it off the top of my head, though. Do you? I thought we had that. I thought we had a view of sort of. Yeah. I'd want to look at the report. Okay. We might. We'll have to look. Yep. Other questions? That yeah. is a good question, though. Yeah. Thank you. Um, of the tool chains, did you break down what tool chains were being used? So when you talk about maybe 10, 15 tool chains, were a majority of them, maybe five or six of them, within security or specific to CI or deployment or anything like that? No, they were pretty generic questions. Um, the, okay. the, the survey itself was... Um, it was, it was pretty compact, is what I would say. And so the, the information, there is a lot of information in the cracks that we didn't quite capture. Okay, no worries, thank you. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't get into naming specific tools. Yeah, to the, the, the granularity that you're looking for, we, we didn't actually capture. And, and again, we were trying to talk to, the, the objective we were trying to talk to were managers and executives. And last time I asked a CIO what tools they use, PowerPoint's usually the first one they tell me about. <laughs> You had, um, it was a middle of the lane sort of benefit that people said that they got, which was a shorter time to ramp okay. new people. Yes. Did you dig into that to find out if the reason that there was a shorter time to ramp was because they were surrounded by people that already knew the tool chain or because it was an industry standard chain so they could go look on the, they could go Google how to do things versus custom tools where you, like, did you get any sense as to why using a single tool chain like this actually led to a faster ramp time versus whatever people were doing before? So not from this survey, but from my own client inquiry where customers, you know, so the way Forrester works is we publish research and then clients of Forrester, you know, click on your report and say, I want to talk to you and ask you a question. So these questions come up and it's like, you know, we're trying to, um, you know, 
figure out, like, you know, standardize around a tool chain, and then we get into the conversation about, well, why? And this comes up a lot, where they say, well, because we have so many different tools, if a developer who understands this particular tool and how it works, and there's rules, and there's business rules encoded in it, and what ends up happening is sort of like, the tool has a surface that's like the, the tip of the iceberg, and then underneath it, there's all these business rules. Yeah. And so then they go to another team, and it's like, oh, well, your business rules are a lot different than the business rules I used to use. And you know, we didn't do it this way. We didn't you know, use that particular scanning tool. We used that particular scanning tool. So what I would say is they end up just sort of tripping over these landmines over and over again, and it ends up becoming frustrating, right? Because it's not, it's not consistent from well, team to team. Silo, right? So right, so they're in silos, and they're, and they're transitioning over. Or um, you, know, you try to get two teams to work together, and they just can't agree on how to actually do things together. And so that's where I think it comes. I don't, I don't necessarily think that one tool is less sophisticated or more complicated than the other, although some tools certainly can be. I just think it's that those teams then sort of further embellish them with rules and scripts and other types of code. I, I suppose you know you could have one tool that becomes really complex as well with all you know manner of business rules uh, built into it. But if it's in one tool, I feel like at least as a common interface to find out where those rules are and you know how to discover them and know how to understand them. Uh, and that there's a common knowledge base across the team or the organization that can help you with shared knowledge. When it's all different individual tools, it's sort of like figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Well, and so you're sort of saying too that um, you may still have to figure it out yourself to start with, but once you've figured it out once, you get to reuse that knowledge yeah. over and over again. Yep, exactly. Other questions? Anybody else? Yes, over here in the front. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, when you're using it in an enterprise, is there a limit on number of teams where you start to have problems in usability of the user interface or being able to apply governance across the teams? Are you talking about the tool itself's ability to scale? Yeah. Uh, that's a question that, uh, in this particular case, you know, for GitLab, I'll let John talk about that. But what I've typically, typically seen is that People are having scaling trouble because they have too many different types of tools. So maybe, uh, you know, it's one thing to say, is it one single tool that's one instance? Um, or is it the same tool just used in multiple places? Right, so those are two different kinds of things, I guess, two different ways to scale that. Um, I guess it, that's a, that's a question I don't, I, don't, I don't actually know the direct answer for. But the, my feeling, so if you look at folks that are moving to like cloud hosted systems, the main reason they're doing it is because they're just sick of managing a bunch of Snowflake servers. And that's why they're moving to the cloud. They're sick of having to ask for someone to create a server for them or you know, stand up a tool chain. So they're, they're, they're moving to the cloud. If you look at people that have teams that manage on-premise installations, they're looking for one tool so that their team can master it and know how to self create self-provisioning systems that can scale that they can actually manage. So there's two different things going on there. Teams that are okay and willing to invest in having an on-premise team to manage their tool chain, they want standardization because it makes it easier for them to, to scale out for the, as a services team. Teams that don't want to have to manage that team or, have the, or can't afford that team are saying, I just want to go to the cloud because I can't afford to manage it myself. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to stand where I can see everyone now. Ah, there yeah. you go. Yes, sir. Um, Chris, wondering if there was any uh, big um, surprises in the research that uh, you know popped up, and maybe or uh, any assumptions that you had that were validated with the research. Yeah. So um, the assumption I originally had was that developers were mostly managing tools, and, and even though like a lot of the companies at Forrester that we work with, their INO team does. But um, you know, my my gut feeling was that. Most of the infrastructure teams are installing the tools, but they're not actually operating or maintaining them. And so this survey kind of, kind of pulled out the fact that developers are typically the ones who are actually doing all the work on that tool, even though maybe some operations guy put it on a server for them. Um, the other thing is that, the, so that was an assumption that got uh, proved. The thing that surprised me was that the people that talked about um, multi-cloud and security as really big driving factors, that, that, that those are the benefits that they want to get from you know, a common tool chain. I think that's really interesting and telling that security is becoming a really big problem for a lot of companies. Um, they're really starting to focus on it and um, they understand that it's not just you know, outside the firewall, it has to be inside the firewall as well. So I, that, was a, that was kind of a surprise to me. I didn't think that was gonna come out. 
Thanks.